Well, welcome Eric onto the Ground Investigation podcast. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you very much, Michael. Perfect, perfect. I wonder if you could give a, a brief background of yourself just to start things off. Okay, uh, right. I'm Eric Downey from Structural Soils and I'm an Associate Director. I've been with Structural Soils for about 11 and a half years. Um, I've come from a sort of, well, 32 years in the industry, um, started off as a contractor, went into consultancy for 10 years and then realized um, that I my first love is contracting, so I went back into contracting. So that is a very brief overview of 32 yeah. years of history. Why, why, what was the, the sort of desire towards going towards more of the contract inside rather than the consultancy? Um, I just feel they're my strengths and I love the project management side of things. I love the cut and thrust. I love the variety. Um, I love being out on site. I love meeting clients. And certainly that is, I do more of that as a contractor as I did as a consultancy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I enjoyed my 10 years as a consultant, don't get me wrong. I learned a lot. Um, however, I was being pushed down a more of a technical route, which wasn't playing to my strengths. And that's why I, I sort of um, came out and went back into contracting. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, because people, generally start with contracting and then they, and then they kind of go off to con um, consultancy usually is what I, I usually see. And then never return, but yes, <laughs> every yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit more in d indoor time, I think. I think yes. that's one of the big pushes and in in more report writing, that sort of thing. Um, mm. Okay, so I can see you were, you were drawn first to geology or paleontology at the tender age of six for your successful fossil hunting. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? And what yeah, you I, um, I, I think I've, I was sort of always been interested in outdoors and I was making mud pies um, when I first sort of grew up with um, in South Africa with our dogs. So we were just make, making mud pies. And then as I grew older, I sort of found these weird things in the ground that looked like animals. I think they were Gryphea, which to other people who aren't geologists, they're sort of devil's toenails. And I found them, I was intrigued about um, just ancient history and, and fossils and, and geology and never really thought of it as a, as a career path, but I always had a hankering after it and um, just didn't know, you know, I just followed my sort of school path and I was very lucky to be able to do geology at A-level. Um, so, and I know they're not, I don't think there's any um, A-level geology courses in the country at the moment, um, which is really sad, <coughs> and we'll probably talk about that later, but I was very lucky and I did A-level geology and that really um, introduced me to the whole um, life as a geologist. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, I certainly remember a lot of people from university starting off their passion with their either fossil collection or rock collection that they'd sort of gathered up over the years. So you say you're from South Africa then, do you, do you go mm. back much at all? Uh, no, I, I've been back a few times. Um, yeah. I, uh, I sort of hanker after my uh, South African roots if ever we're playing rugby and they're winning. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I do have a, um, a South African cycling top um, and whenever I hear a South African accent, I always try and um, sort of hone in on that and ask questions yeah. about where they've come from and all the rest. So yes, but I, Fair enough. I, I, it's a beautiful country. Obviously there's political situation issues there, yeah. but, um, it is an, an absolutely stunning, beautiful country and it's well worth the visit. Do you find if you're around people from South Africa that your accent comes out a little bit more perhaps? Or do you uh, believe it's such no, a I, I, I left when I was four years old. So, oh, I okay. so not much, of it, not much developed there then. Okay. No, no. Fair enough. So your first role after leaving university was a mud logger for Halliburton. Um, can yes. you provide some details of what a, a mud logger actually does and how your time was there? Yeah, no, I, again, I never really understood, well, I didn't know about engineering geology. I just assumed mm -hmm. that a geologist had to go into the oil industry. This was before the internet. Yeah. This was, so um, I was sort of, we, I went to Kingston Polytechnic or uh, at the time, which is now Kingston University, and I had a fantastic course, and they had lots of connections with the oil industry, and we had um, 
Xlog, and I think we had Halle Burton at the time. So, um, and I actually got the job with Xlog, um, and we did a um, a logging course in Windsor, and it was really good. I went up to Aberdeen and did a a fire a Grampian Fire Brigade training course um, where you get flipped upside down in a helicopter in a swimming pool, and you know it was just fantastic fun. Um, but then we went to Holland for my first hitch, as they call them, um, and that was a bit weird. Um, so you'd sort of left the the environment of a university and straight out on a um, on a, a sort of industrial work site which was quite a shock to the system um, and then I did two weeks out there and then was sent off to Tunisia um, and I was replacing somebody who'd broken their leg so I was a bit concerned um, about that and um, yeah. when I was driving in from Tunis to the rig site um, I saw a, a load of drill pipe um, spill all over the road and yeah it was just you know there was no health and safety this was 91 well 91 it was so it was a long long time ago um and yeah it was a baptism of fire uh unfortunately i just didn't really it was just a leap too big too soon and it just wasn't for me so i think for some people it's great um but mm -hmm. yeah I, I just would have liked maybe six months of more um, experience before they threw me out into Tunisia, which was quite remote. And at sort of 20-ish years old, you're quite naive. And it's, as I said before, the internet, so you couldn't really check up on TripAdvisor what it was going to be yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, 100%. I, th I think when, when I was finishing my degree, it, it was never really all, because I don't think the oil was doing very well at the time. It was more potential mineral exploration which was seemed to be the more exciting side of it i think um which i know a few people that have gone in but but most i mean it, it's weird because even some people go to university they'll do a geology degree and then they'll go and do something completely different which when we were i think that was the first year we started to pay sort of nine thousand a year and mm. be lumped with quite a large debt um over time so it's quite odd how how people would do that i suppose but i suppose they were mm they were young um, and they wanted to just progress in some way I think. Um, yeah. So you, you, your first proper job in GI uh, was yeah. with Socotec or ESG as they were? Well um, it was actually one step before that I worked for Brian Hawkins at Bristol University as a research okay. assistant. He sort of I cut my teeth in engineering geology with him and yeah. um, I worked on the Bath Stone Mine project um, mm -hmm. and a very fledgling um, a company called Hydrock, which some of your viewers may have heard yeah. of. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. So, um, that was the sort of the the, the start of, of Hydrock, um, but this was even before Hydrock was even thought of. But they mm -hmm. were pumping um, foam concrete. Well, they were um, just doing a, literally an underground ground investigation of the fill material within the mine. So we were surveying the mine. Um, looking at sort of compaction of the fill underground. Um, so it was a, an amazing opportunity. I also worked on um, an Avon Ring Road project um, where the piles had failed and they were going to put a bridge across. Um, okay. So it really opened my eyes to engineering geology and yeah, I absolutely loved it. So that was sort of my um, desire to sort of main, stay in the engineering geology field. Okay, so that's, then that's you're right. I did I then get, yeah, I then, I need, it, unfortunately it wasn't a permanent contract and I was looking for a permanent contract because I wanted mm -hmm. to get married and needed to buy a house and all the rest. So yeah. um, unfortunately I couldn't do that um, on a temporary role that I had with, with Brian. So I did get this job with, um, it was actually um, Structural Soils, uh, sorry, um, Soil Mechanics at the time which yeah. was part of a um, which was part of a, a company called KSW and they were working on a Nirex project for a deep nuclear um, repository up near Sellafield. Um, yeah. Obviously the, the country has uh, a great desire to produce nuclear energy but nowhere to put the nuclear waste. So we were part of a ground investigation, a, the, the largest ground investigation probably at that time um, to find somewhere to, to find somewhere suitable in the ground to 
put high level um, nuclear waste. So this was at the time 550 million pounds worth of um, GI um, to find a location to do that. So we were drilling holes down to 3000 meters. Uh, we were working 24 seven, uh, seven days a week, um, Christmas day, Boxing day, New Year's day, and, and, you know, and it was, it was yeah. great fun, but really hard work, really hard work. But I, I've made some fantastic um, connections, friends uh, that have lasted all of my career so far. Okay, how, how long did it take to get down to 3000 meters? Um, yeah, it, I did um, look this up actually, and um, I've only the only details I've got is for two thousand meters. Uh, okay. It took two hundred and seventy-five days, but that's twenty-four hour drilling, yeah. so that's three quarters of a year, twenty-four-seven drilling. Mm -hmm. There was it wasn't pure drilling. We were doing lots of testing on the way down as well, just testing the the ground, the the hydrological conditions, and all the rest. So it wasn't pure just drilling um, straight to the bottom. Um, okay. We did have to do lots of testing on the way down. So yes, I think it would take over a year to drill, of 24 seven to drill down to 3000 meters. Um, but it is a massive, massive undertaking. It was a, um, so coming from the oil industry, I did actually have some experience about working on a land rig um, and the Derrickman, the, the driller, the, the, the company man, all the rest. So I sort of knew some of the terms that I needed to know, but yeah, it was, um, yeah. Soil mechanics were, were sort of, part of the core handling team so we had to look after the core coming out of the ground um take it out of the core barrel chop it up in it was came out in six meter lengths we had to chop it up into a meter and a half sections um uh, clean it sample it label it um and then give it to our clients for for the logging which was sir alexander gibb which now don't exist anymore Okay, okay. W was there anything any modifications to the to the rig at all was it a specialist rig or um, yeah, the, the, the core barrel, I think, came from a company called BRR, which were a German-based company. I think the Germans still, back then, produced the best um, sort of drilling equipment. Uh, I don't know about now, actually, but they certainly had the best core barrel set up. And, um, yeah, we were using a German set, um, sort of team there, um, and they were, they were our sort of technical advisors on that but yeah it was it was a very much a multinational um, th um, sort of company operation so we had Kentings doing the drilling um, Sol, Sol Mechanics doing doing the core handling and this BRR company and that was the KSW. Okay so another interesting project you were part of was drilling and um, trial pitting in Kazakhstan up to <laughs> minus 30 degrees could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, again, when I was working for Structural Soils, I had the opportunity to work, uh, well, I was, um, well, I was, I was given the opportunity to work in Kazakhstan, and I obviously leapt at the chance, um, yeah. and it was uh, a real challenge. Um, we were training up local Kazakh geologists to undertake a ground investigation um, on the site and it was underneath the site was a copper porphyry so they were looking to to get out the copper um as a as a resource and um yeah so i was training up kazakh geologists so we could either go in at winter time in minus 30 or probably about plus 30 in the summertime but they wanted to do the construction in the summertime so we did the gi in the winter time and yes we were um, doing rotary drilling we were doing trial pitting and we had permafrost um, down to about a meter and a half um, and it was just so cold and my eyelids were freezing um, yeah it was a, um, a very big challenge to do this so yeah I enjoyed yeah. it must have been mentally and physically very challenging to um, to be part of a project like that uh, yeah, it, w it was physically challenging, but we were given the correct PPE. We were given uh, fantastic sort of um, coats that kept us nice and warm um, and um, boots that would, you know, that I never got, I was never cold uh, in my extremities apart from my face and my eyes <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and trying to, I mean, 
luckily I didn't have to write too much because um, I was teaching um, but we did have to then re-log the material back in our office in its unfrozen state so that it gave the designers a chance to understand what the, pro the, the ground properties were like once it had, had sort of frosted and defrosted um, so uh, yeah it was and and also the food um, that they had there. I mean, I don't know if you've got any vegetarians on the on this uh, listening in, but uh, yeah, it's probably not the best thing to go as a vegetarian because no. we were given uh, a sheep's head and and as one of the delicacies. And um, I had to, well, the the most important person on the site had to have the eyeballs, and I was given a, an ear um, to eat as a as a as a token of their esteem of us um, helping them out. Wow. Okay, well, that's uh, that's an interesting one. So I'm not sure which would be better, the eyeball or the ear, to be honest. That well, I, 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 think, I think I, I chose the ear. Well, I was lucky. I was given the ear. I'm glad I didn't have the eyeballs. It was the, even Bush Tucker trials uh, yeah, before yeah. Bush Tucker trials even came along. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's what, I was, that's what I was kind of thinking in my head. So I, I just asked a moment about the modifications for the Sellafield rig. So there must have been some, you know, some definite modifications or a definite specialist rig used for, for such a job. Yeah, the, the, the drilling rig actually came into in a container. So it was the first time I've ever seen a drilling rig inside a container. And again, um, as much as we love um, health and safety, there was no health and safety in Kazakhstan whatsoever. Um, so they had this massive blowtorch to try and defrost the, um, the drill pipes. Um, so we were working inside a container <laughs> in the logging, or sort of half the container was the engineering bit and then half the, drill, half the end was the drilling end. And the drillers were there with a blowtorch trying to defrost the pipes. We had to get uh, water in from a local source and we had to rush it to where we were drilling so that it didn't freeze. Um, yeah, um, so that, yeah, there was, that was the, the sort of biggest modification or um, just to try and keep things unfrozen, but sometimes everything just froze and it was just, it was hopeless. So we just had to wait until we could get things defrosted. So yeah, it was interesting times, let's say. No one got hurt that I saw, but um, it wasn't, yeah. you wouldn't want a health and safety advisor on that job. <laughs> No, I'd imagine. <clears throat> I'd imagine. So you're saying you also carried out some some trial pitting over there in the the cold temperatures. Um, so, but luckily you you weren't sort of doing the writing yourself. I, I assume they, they couldn't have used any type of ink there because it would it would freeze. Uh, yeah, I, I I really can't remember. Uh, maybe I think they used pencils. I think pencils oh, seem yeah. to work really well. I they mean, do. luckily it wasn't wet and it, it was so cold that you know any sort yeah. of moisture was snow. So I think we just used pencils um, and that seemed to work really well. So, you know, back to, to, you know, yes, it would have been lovely to do tablets, but I don't think even tablets um, back no, then would have no would have worked in the cold. Um, but yeah, a trusty pen and uh, oh, a trusty, uh, trusty sort of, um, sort of pencil and paper were, were the way yeah. forward. Yeah, and what was, I mean, I can't imagine you, you remember exactly, but was it windy there? What, because I mean that really, really helped lower uh, the yeah, temperature time, as well. Yeah, at time. I mean, we were just um, yeah, we were 19 hours north of Almaty, um, mm -hmm. and we were towed there because um, our truck broke down. So we were towed there on a on a very short um, bit of rope. But it was it was windy. Um, yeah, it was um, yeah, or it was just south of Siberia, really. So we had the lovely. Yeah. Um, Siberian wind hitting us uh, sort of head on. Really. <laughs> I can, I can just imagine who's, who's going to write this log and you take off your thick gloves and like, oh, it's not me, I don't think, but uh, you well, yeah, had a good and, role there. But, we had Russian translators, so that was interesting. So, and the Russians and the Kazakhs didn't really get on. So we were sort of asked to be, well, we had to be a bit mediators as well. I mean, they were being, everyone was being paid, but mm -hmm. you know, you could understand there was a little bit of animosity between the two. So um, yeah, we had to be, you know, had to sort of try and make the peace between the the, the, the Russians and the and the Kazakhs. But um, yeah, it was it was um, it was an interesting, challenging time. But you know, it's it's helped me be who I am today. So yeah, nothing, you know, when someone moans to me about trial pitting in the rain in the UK, yeah. I just laugh at them, which is probably yeah. not the right thing to do. <laughs> no, that would be me moaning as well. <laughs> so, uh, so a metre and a half of permafrost, you must have needed a, a decent um, sort of JCB to, to get for that. Yeah, nice, it, nice was, it was a, 
Yeah, it was a big old excavator. I, I think it must have been about a 30 tonner or something like that, but it was yeah. a massive, massive, big tooth. I mean, you could actually almost, uh, I, we actually did cower. Sometimes when the wind was so bad, we actually cowered in the bucket um, to keep out of the, the wind and the, and the cold. Um, but yeah, it was a big old bucket. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it took a little while to smash through uh, a metre and a half of ice and rock, uh, or mud basically, which was the same as rock. And okay. then we got down into the sort of natural ground. And then as soon as we hit the rock, then we obviously had to stop. But that was, yeah, um, we, I can't remember how many trial pits we did, but we probably did sort of two or three a day. Um, and yeah, it was seriously cold. Um, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine. I can imagine if we if we had an order for engineers or something. I'd imagine everyone wants to go, but no one would actually want to do the work whilst they were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, it was it was a, a great. I mean, it was the first time I went um, business class as well. So our client sent us business class. So uh, that was uh, quite nice. Um, but yeah, that was the one. That luxury ended as soon as the flight ended, and then it became hard work. <laughs> yeah. So have you been part of any other exotic or unusual projects over the years? Um, yeah, I think I've been in lots of different places. I, I don't know whether you'd call them exotic. If you call the River Mersey exotic, I'm not sure. People from uh, Liverpool probably think River Mersey is lovely, but I was on the sandbanks yeah. um, by Warrington uh, and the, um, the, the Mersey Gateway Bridge. So um, Structural Soils had the ground investigation project to design, well, to do the ground investigation for the, for the um, bridge pillars um and the bridge decks so um yeah we were had a, a jack up barge in the deep parts of the river mersey and we had a spud leg barge on the sandbank so i was responsible for making sure all of that uh, worked smoothly um we had sort of teams from bristol teams from castleford working there um and yeah it was a, a it was a, well it was longer than six weeks i was only there for about six weeks but it was a again a, a very very challenging job yeah. Um, the, another exotic location I had was working in uh, Queen Street Tunnel in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, that was over Hogmanay, um, and we were undertaking a ground investigation inside the tunnel to drop the track so they could put up the pantographs for the electrification of the line um, from Edinburgh to Glasgow. So. Again, I have you know I've worked in Devonport dockyards um, with some amazing um, stealth boats all around us. Um, if I tell you, I'm going to have to shoot you, so I won't, <laughs> I won't tell okay. you. But, um, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, so I think as a geologist, as an engineering geologist, you get to some work in some pretty unusual places. Um, I also work on the railways uh, all over the country at night time. Um, so yes, you see some very interesting things um, all around uh, in very different places that you wouldn't normally get to go and see. So, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity to see see the UK in a very different world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I suppose uh, Liverpool would, uh, would probably be exotic to the Kazakhstans, I suppose, wouldn't it? Maybe we can go the, go the other way. Um, but it, it, who's uh, inspired you and supported you over your career to date, Eric? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, I think really the first person that I need to, to thank is um, my geology teacher, Keith Mosley. Um, he really sort of inspired me and gave me the thirst for knowledge. And I absolutely, um, you know, owe him a debt of gratitude um, to, you know, because I wouldn't be able to do what I do now without him. Um, the next person is John Tinkler. He was my sort of boss at Sellafield and he taught me a huge uh, amount of, of things and, and the most important thing was leading from the front and so he would never ask you to do something that he wouldn't do himself and I've, I've used that all of my life, uh, all of my career since so you know that was a fantastic um, he was a fa well he's still around uh, and we, we communicate quite you know often um, and yeah he's certainly um, uh, one of my inspirations. Um, one of the other people that I really um, look up to is Natalie Booz, who's used to work with us at Structural Soils. She's now gone off to be MD at Concept. And again, you know, she's a determined um, single mum, 
But, you know, she's now an MD of a ground investigation company. So through hard work, determination, um, you know, anything is possible. And, and I love her can-do attitude. You know, she works tirelessly. She never, you know, she when she has a sort of focus on something, she just goes and gets it. Um, you know, so that she's, I take some inspiration from her. Um, the other person that um, I really look up to is our MD at Structural Soils, Stephen Makareth. He's been at Structural Soils for over 30 years. Um, he's worked his way up from an engineer all the way through to MD. So again, through determination, um, hard work and perseverance, you know, he has dedicated his whole career to Structural Soils. And, and there are not many people in the country that can say that they've done 30 years with the same company. And uh, that's quite yeah. a, um, uh, an accolade really. So, you know, and he leads from the front, you know, he will never ask you to do anything that you wouldn't, he wouldn't do himself. He goes out, um, he will visit sites. He probably doesn't do as much site work as, as, as others, but you know, he's fully aware of all of the different operations we have. He makes sure he visits all of our offices and keeps his um, you know, presence uh, on all of our offices. So, you know, it's great to have him as our, as our MD. Yeah, yeah, and it is extremely rare for, for someone to stay into a company for, for 30 years. Very rare indeed, we, we very rarely <laughs> see it. Um, but yeah, I mean, determination, perseverance can kind of get you anywhere, really, can't it? If you, you know, you set your mind to something, mm. keep going at it, and uh, and you can do amazing things, really. Um, what what are sort of some of the most important lessons that you've learned over the years, and what advice would you give to yourself now that you've learned these lessons? Um, right. I think, uh, well, one of the things I haven't mentioned so far is sort of good timekeeping. Um, certainly what I learned up at Sellafield is that we were working 12 hour shifts. So if you were late turning up in the evening for your for your oppo who was you was you were relieving, he would be late for you in the morning. So, you know, you learn very quickly, never be late. So I make a, a point of always sort of you know, being on time, if we agree a, a time and a place, we I will always be there, you know, and always allow plenty of time for that. Um, again, don't ask somebody to do something that, you know, that's totally unachievable. Um, be realistic with your request to people um, and, and get involved. So again, if I'm on site yesterday, I was at UE, I was helping our second man, our, our driller dig a starter pit. So yes, I'm an associate director, but I was still, there was only him and I on site. So yeah. <laughs> we, you know, I couldn't, you know, I was digging a starter pit. So, you know, that's, you know, I, I don't mind doing that. Um, I'm lucky I'm physically, you know, I'm 54 years old now, but you know, I'm still happy enough to dig a starter pit. And I think, you know, that goes a long way. If people see you lifting bentonite bags, um, you know, clearing up a site, loading a, a, you know, loading material onto a wagon, you know, everyone, you know, can't step by, can't stop by. So, you know, they, they will join in as well. So lead from the front. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, definitely. And um, seeing someone of your level um, chipping in essentially is, you know, is something that people should should see, especially the sort of the, the graduates coming in. Um, mm. But yeah, no, it's a, it's an important thing to to do. So, what what's the most important advice for graduates coming into the ground investigation industry? Would you give? Um, I think it's it's a great um, career path. Um, I've been lucky and I've been able to sort of choose the sort of path that I want to take. But I think if you've got a passion for a certain element within the industry, so maybe you want to do um, reporting or more on site or go into a health and safety role, you can do that all within uh, sort of the ground engineering or the ground um, investigation industry, um, you know, Certainly in the contracting world, you are able to sort of, well, I was been able to direct myself a little bit easier. Um, but it's, it is a, it is hard work, don't get me wrong. Um, but again, if you, 
with that hard work comes great rewards if you do a good job um, and you can see if you go back in a year's time you see a building built where you've done that ground investigation there's a sense of pride um, to say well that building actually wouldn't be there without my hard work um, but yeah um, it, it's a uh, it is a great career path. I've never been out of work in 30 odd years of, of um, being in this industry. So I think sometimes, um, you know, you may go into some professions and, you know, it's like, say, say the oil industry and it is boom and bust. And I've, I've known people to be um, have lost their jobs in the oil industry. And again, if you're paid a high wage and you lose that wage, you're going to be yeah. struggling. So with the ground engineering industry, there is a bit of a um, there is a shortage of, of suitably qualified people, um, so there is lots and lots of work in it. So I would definitely say that it's a very viable uh, option to choose. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there is a, there's a shortage at the moment, definitely. Um, what, what would you say personal qualities would be important of someone, you know, a graduate coming in to, to stick and stay really throughout the industry? <laughs> Uh, personal qualities, you know, hard working, um, be nice to everybody because you never know when, you know, don't be horrible to anybody because it's a very small world. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've, I have generally worked hard. Um, I try and be nice to most people most of the time. <laughs> Some people may differ. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but I think sometimes it's like a family. I, again, sometimes you may get upset, disappointed with somebody or something. But you know, it's it's like being in a family. It's very quickly forgotten, forgiven. Um, you're only doing or saying something because you want something done right in the correct way yeah. um, and you want it done uh, professionally so you know I have sort of high expectations of people but I would do the same myself so um, yeah it's it is difficult um, but yeah that that's sort of my little gem of information yeah no, I think you have to be a hardy character I think to to have a long-term successful career I, I think in, mm. in the ground investigation industry so the, whether it's the, the working outside or dealing with the the other contractors on site um you know I, I think that that's one of the qualities you would need also um and it, it's a particular passion of yours to attract and entice new blood into the industry can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what yeah you do to make uh, that i happen? mean yeah i this is the what i love most about my role um i have the you know uh, again steve macareth rmd he's very um proactive for me to go out into the local schools into the universities um so i go to birmingham university yesterday i was at the university of west of england we gave a field demonstration to a load of msc civil engineers about ground um ground technique so we took a super cat window sample rig we took them um, some gpr kit and we showed them what all this is about um you know i just want to you know and and also go into sort of secondary schools um we're desperate to you know keep the interest going and, and let people know about engineering geology and if we don't and civil engineering and if we don't let people know people aren't going to come into our industry so our industry yeah. is going to be dead yeah no so you're flying a flag essentially mm. um so i mean if if someone was considering going into our industry but they could be paid more you know to go into a different aid uh, different industry what what would you say to them um but yeah i Yes, I know there are other industries that would pay more, but mm. I think you have to come back from a day's work and feel as though you've achieved something. Um, you've got a, a sort of bit of pride in what you've done. Yeah. Um, you get thanked for, for doing a good job. Um, I don't know, it, 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 that's a really hard question. I mean, I just I'm very passionate about what I do and I don't think yeah. I could do anything else I, I wouldn't want to do anything else um, I I just I think the the ground engineering business is, is like a family and we all know each other we'll all help each other out mm -hmm. I mean we'll, we'll I'll use this as an example um, you know Mark Lindell will will uh, tell me about a certain um, or he, he uh, 
a certain thing that he just can't do. So he'll give me a phone call and say, or, oh, you know, there's this contract here, you know, do you want to do that? Or um, Noel Greeley from BAMS will say, oh, we've lost, we haven't got a bit or we've broken something. Can we borrow something of yours? So, you know, he'll give me a call. I'll make it, you know, so we will. Yes, we are competitors, but yes, we'll help each other out. And, and yeah. I think, you know, there aren't many industries out there that you can do that. Um, so it, it is a real, we are, you know, we try and do our best for our clients and we are competitive, but, you know, if somebody is stuck and, and you know, in trouble, we will always help them out. And I think that is something that is very rare in, in, in industry as, as a general rule. Yeah, no, definitely. I think what, what got me into it and which has made it enjoyable for myself is, is traveling around to to different sites but to see you know different geology essentially whether it's um it's trial pitting or, or more to the point you know some rotary drilling in and seeing it geology up and down the uk um and of course there's a difference if you're stuck in the middle of london somewhere um you know fencing everything off and or the, the public coming up to you or being in a farmer's field, being sort of left alone, mm. nice and quiet. Um, and if you've got some good drillers to work with, then then it really is it, it's hard to beat. I think it is a great it is, can be a great job. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, let me just grab this other question. Um, so it states on your CV that you're good at motivating people in the office and on site. How how do you go about doing that? That's right. Really hard thing uh, to do. Yeah. It. Well, I I try and do my best at this, um, and I try and, as I said already, I sort of lead from the front. So if I'm, you know, if there's a job to do on site, like um, moving bentonite or digging mm -hmm. a starter pit, and I see something flagging, then I'll jump in and help. Um, I have been on site with um a driller and we were in london it was eight o'clock in the morning it was horizontal snow um and he was moaning and about being there at eight o'clock in the morning um and the weather wasn't kind i admit that but i just said to him i said right the faster we do this the faster we go home and you know i'm here to help you as much as i can let's just get the job done and let's go home i don't want to be here you don't want to be here <laughs> um you know, and I tried that and, and that seemed to work. That sort of got him on board. Yes, he was frustrated. Um, mm -hmm. And another time sort of just being calm and 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 not forceful, but um, just trying to be determined, I think is a word to do. Um, and, and just saying, right, how about we try something? And how about we try this and give them the reason why we need to do this. And, and so that they get a bit more buy-in of why we're doing what we are doing, rather than just yeah. telling, just uh, tell, give them the why of what we're, the purpose of why we're here. And, and that mean that sort of gets them a bit more motivated rather than just say right go off and drill your 10 meter borehole we're actually telling them why they're drilling that 10 meter borehole and that's i think that's a really good way and and you know in the office um just be as supportive as you can you know what you don't want to do is tell them the answer but you want to give them the tools to try and get find the answer for themselves because if you give them the answer all the time um, then they're just going to keep and they're not going to learn anything but you know you they will learn from their mistakes and hopefully be better and then don't make those mistakes again yeah definitely so that would be um, yeah good good way to to motivate people how how what's your typical week look like for you <laughs> I never have a typical week uh, and that's what I love and I think that's the the joy of doing my job I mean I can be talking to clients I can be digging starter pits. I can be doing a night shift. Next week, I'm in uh, Manchester United's ground on a on a um, a Volker's open day, yeah. uh, supplier day. So uh, I could be at an awards dinner. Um, I could be doing tenders. I can do being multi million pound tenders. Um, you know, whatever the, uh, whatever the the company needs and wherever the company needs me, I will do whatever they've asked me to do. So I'm very lucky that I can do lots of different roles. And, and that's what I love about uh, being a ground investigation engineer. So I know it sounds like a very good variety. So you said there about being on a night shift. What, what, would, you, what would you do on a night shift? 
Would you be doing that um, yourself? Right, or? generally it's on a, yeah, generally um, I, I work on a night shift on a railway shift. Yeah. So obviously the railway network is shut down. Yeah. So I will be planning all of the works uh, in the daytime, but then we will execute their work in the nighttime. So it may be some window sampling on a railway track. It may be rotary drilling inside a tunnel. Um, and there's a huge amount of planning. You know, the, 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 once you're actually on site, there's very uh, at night time, there's very little that you can do if anything goes wrong. So um, you've got to do a huge amount of planning before the site work start, making sure you haven't forgotten everything, making sure you've got double of everything or not of everything, but you you know, and, and um, yeah, and you just muck in as much as you can to get the job done. Um, it, yeah, so I've, I've done night shifts on the River Mersey as well. We had to move um, the, one of the barges um, on, on a night shift. So, you know, you had to um, communicate with um, the, um, uh, the barge master and the, the tugboat to make sure that we can get the, the barge off the, the sandbank in, on a high tide and pray that the water was going. So there's lots of uh, risk and reward and, and you know, it, it could be anything, anything. Okay, what's what's next for you, Pat, and and uh, what's next for your career aspirations? Um, you know, I'm happy at Structural Soils. Um, I'm, you know, yes, it'd be nice to be a director of Structural Soils, but you know, I'm happy as an associate director. Um, I love my current role. Um, I I see myself there for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully engaging, you know, carrying on what I'm currently doing, engaging the next generation of, of ground engineers um, from either the universities or schools, um, sort of doing some, you know, keeping, doing tenders, which I quite enjoy doing, meeting clients. Um, so yeah, just keeping doing what I'm, what I'm currently doing. So I, I love my role. Okay, okay, okay. If there was one thing in which you could change in the ground investigation industry, if you just clicked your fingers and made it happen, what would it be and <laughs> why? Um, I just think there is a skill shortage and I would love the government to reinstate geology as a an option in, in secondary schools. I think yep. if people have the chance to do that, we've, you know, I am one person. I know some of my other colleagues, Natalie um, and probably Mark, and and I know that Bam Ritchie's go into schools and do stuff. But we're only a small part of who can make change. Really, the government needs to. Um, I know times are tough at the moment. We've all heard that on the news. But if there is any chance, if you if I could click my fingers, I would want geology reinstated as a secondary yeah. school A level subject or even O level. Uh, I know it's part of ge uh, geography, but a very, very small part of a geography course. Um, and I think the construction industry is going to really, really suffer in 10 years time. If we don't have geology um, out there, the construction industry is going to be on its knees because we're not going to have enough qualified people to be able to do the job that we I currently do and it's going to be very scary uh, for the construction industry as a whole so I think somebody really does need to make a, um, a call on that very soon yeah definitely do, do you ever take any of the students at all out on some kind of field trip or allow them to come out to site and view it or is there, is there some obvious health um, and safety it, it's yeah unfortunately yeah, unfortunately, it is quite difficult to do that. It was wonderful yesterday in yeah. that um, the University of West of England actually had a patch of um, sort of made ground that we could work on mm -hmm. so we could actually bring the drilling rig to them. Um, <coughs> however, that's, you know, very rare that we can do that. We did bring Plymouth University up to our plant yard and see some of the kit that we had and took them around our laboratory as well. Um, but it's yeah it with with the sort of health and safety element that is so crucial in our industry yeah. it's very hard to get people the with the right CSCS card to come onto site you know we 
and most clients won't allow that so it does need to be yeah. on a private bit of land that we can show them what we can do but you know there's nothing wrong with us taking pictures and then sh giving them presentation in their in their um, university building which is what I do okay what about um, say a log and shed something like that where they you know the um, logging all the rock. yeah well any of our lab tours that we do I generally take people around our um, soil and rock laboratory in Bristol and I also take them around where the engineers um, do their logging and so they can actually see the rock logging and where the photography is undertaken yeah. and where we sample rock so they can see as much as they um, could within the safe environment of, of our um, yard and our, our laboratory in Bristol. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good idea to, if you can take them around where they're actively logging and, and what that means in, in terms of, you know, how the, how the eventual construction is going to be created and by what you find, you know, alters that, then, then that can get them at a, a fundamental level, I think. I think that'd be, if you're interested in geology and you're interested in engineering, then that's, I think that'd be ideal. Okay, so on the flip side, what do you love about the GI industry? Well, as I've said before, it is, um, I call it my family. Yeah. Um, you know, I know <clears throat> a lot of people in the industry and if I need a favor, I know I'll get that. Um, you know, it is, very rare uh, I mean I go to Geotechnica and it's just the highlight of my year um, yes it's a bit of back slapping but you know I can see our competitors soil engineering concept Bam Ritchie's we're all competitors but at the end of the day we're all doing as best job we can for our clients um, we all have a drink together um, and we'll we'll talk about the good times or any issues we have on site and there um, but you know, it is just a, a wonderful uh, family sort of entity that we have within the industry. Um, yeah, and, and it, it's it's a great job for anybody looking for a, a career path. Um, and you, you, every day is different. You know, no site is the same in any shape or form with the people you're working with, with the geology that you have encounter um, and the site constraints that you have on that site. And you have to be a problem solver um, you have to be practical, you have to be, um, yeah, negotiate, you have to do all sorts of things all at the same time, which is just uh, a great thing to do. And it's, you know, no day is the same. And that's why I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned Gia Technica there, which I think I went for the first time in 2021. And we displayed um, for the, the Ground Investigation Recruitment Company. Um, but it was good to meet up. Everyone was sort of friendly and nice. There's there's some interesting um, talks that are put on as well, which are a, mm. a great thing to do, especially for people that are young in the industry or thinking about going into the industry to be able to turn up and and listen, you know, to, to all these different sides as well. But um, mm. okay, so we're pretty much coming to the end now, Eric. Do you have anything more to say? I know there's no, a. I, uh, I... Go on. I just yeah I'm very pleased that you're doing these and thank you Michael and it's great that you've got you've had some really interesting people and I know you've got some future people coming on to your podcast and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about from their stories as well so thank you very much for doing this and you know this is the first time anybody from the industry is doing it and it's great to hear from Mark and Sam and John and Brock that you've had on before so thank you for that excellent now that's 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 fantastic I will mention one more thing um, which will be the Structural Soils Engineers Handbook that we will put in the oh, show yes. notes as well. Um, which That's is a very, very kind, yes. versatile um. thing. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> I actually seen someone um, mention it the other day on on LinkedIn. So that was that was written a little while ago, wasn't it? That because I've seen that a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, it, it start. It's it. Yeah, it started off um, sort of a guy called Tim Clifford did it in its first sense he went off um, and we've updated it and it it keeps getting updated with the British standards being updated so okay. that was quite a, um, a, a a sort of yeah it's it's just been it's great to to have something like that in the industry and it's freely available for to download on our website um, you know we want every engineer in the country and every ground engineer in the country to have that on on their um, phone their desktop and 
you know, if there are any modifications on there, please let us know, or any updates that you want to be feel that should be included, please let yeah. us know, and we'll do our best to get them included. But it's already, it used to be 54 pages, uh, the newest version now is 63 pages, okay. so... Um, yeah, it, it's a very good guide, um, and you know it's it easy to digest, and, and hopefully a benefit to everybody in the industry. Yeah, no, I've used it myself. Um, it, it's pocket size, which is ideal for site, but also you can download it and have it on your phone and access that whenever mm. you have charge on your phone. But, uh, <laughs> all right, well, thanks very much for for coming on the podcast, Derek. Um, good luck for the future, and I'm sure we'll I'll be in touch in the near future mm. and uh, have further discussions. But thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you ever so much, Michael, for the opportunity. It's been thank great. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.